Welcome to Remember, Remember, a show about histories, mysteries, and loose lips sinking ships. Is it about that, though? You know, you did World War II and stuff. All right. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Paula, and joining me, ready to Wilco his way through this tin pickle of an episode by beating his gums, is Matthew Jude. Been on the internet, have you, Paula? <laughs> That's a bunch of supposed World War II slang. Blimey. <laughs> <laughs> Did you know that haywire became slang for malfunction because they would use hay baling wire to fix things? This is apparently World War II slang. That's where in haywire came about. That's so cool. I mean, I like that. They MacGyvered it. They haywired it. And you know what's like wire? Antennas for wireless transmitters. And you know who used those? World War II spies. I don't know if that worked, Paula, but I'm glad that you tried. I think it sort of works. <laughs> but here we are at the topic of today's episode. I got there and I sort of made it connect. Today's episode is all about Nor and Ayat Khan, alias Nora Baker, alias Jean-Marie Regnier, alias Madeline. That's too many aliases, Paula. It's a lot of names. <laughs> I'm going to start there. That's too much to remember. <laughs> That's not going to work. Before we dive in, it's important that we acknowledge a few things. The first thing is, this is a history podcast that is also a comedy podcast. We are going to be making jokes today, and some of them might be a bit irreverent. I feel like we're setting the audience up to expect something that I don't know if I can deliver on, but I'm <laughs> going to try, I guess. And Matthew's going to have lots of jokes. <laughs> oh God, <laughs> is that funny yet? But this story is also about World War II and Nazis and very real sacrifice that we here deeply respect and want to honor. So things might get a little dark, but we're going to do our best to shine a little light. In July of 1940, British Minister of Economic Warfare, Hugh Dalton, formed the Special Operations Executive, or SOE. Formed just a month after the Nazis secured their occupation of France, the SOE was a response to Germany now controlling Western Europe. The SOE's major objectives were to help organize and supply resistance groups in occupied territories and commit sabotage, like blowing up train tracks. They were like a formal resistance cell organizer, weren't they? Yes. They weren't doing like grand campaigns. They were like, you could blow it up. <laughs> I like to imagine, actually, a lot of SOE activity to be like that scene in The Sound of Music when the Nazi soldier's trying to start his car and the engine won't turn over and it's revealed that the two nuns have removed, like, bits of the engine. A lot of nun costumes at the SOE. A lot of nun Gotta costumes, be. a lot of breaking out into song. It's highly musical. Actually, you'll be surprised how many breakouts from World War II prisoner of war camps involved elaborate cross-dressing. And uh, I've got to respect it, honestly. The SOE is organized into sections, typically based on country the operatives are working in. And those sections are broken down into circuits. All the operatives are given aliases to justify their presence in the territory and a separate code name that everyone else in their circuit knows them as. Circuits have leaders, operatives going out and reenacting the scene from Sound of Music, mm -hmm. couriers who carried messages and were typically women, and wireless transmitter operators widely regarded as the most dangerous job an SOE operative could have. The average life expectancy of a wireless operator behind enemy lines was only six weeks. I didn't understand why this was such a dangerous job, but then I was like, oh, you have to go there to do it. You have to go to, to the place where they are yeah. to send the messages back. And at the all time that's happening, you know that the Germans are listening to your transmissions, yeah. trying to work out where you are. Yeah, it's pretty... We talk about, I'll talk about it a little more later, but yes, exactly. But if you say something like, they're moving people in down Rue de la Belvedere or something, they go, probably near there, because they know we just 20 minutes ago put troops down that street, you know? It was a super dangerous job. Yeah, and that's why everything had to be coded as well, because anyone can hear the signals, anyone can hear the messages. And it's so much more fun. And it's a lot more fun if it's in code, right? It feels a lot more like you're an actual spy 
and not just like a errand boy. Yeah, these were actual spies, though. It's <laughs> they a, were actual it's spies. A, as dangerous and as life threatening and in in real terms this was, it is pretty cool. It's it's pretty cool. In June 1943, the first female wireless operator is airdropped into France. Later, wireless operators will also be given parachutes. <laughs> Yeah, they were just pushed her out of the plane. She just went. She actually didn't parachute in. Others, other people did. Yeah. But they actually like landed the plane and she just got out of it. But her name was Noor Inayat Khan. Code name, Madeline. Flashback sound. Some text appears on the screen reading, 29 years earlier. Do you like that? Do you like I made it like fancy? I gave it some production value. I like that we're doing real visual effects so that we don't have to add any later. If I'm honest. Could you make this a pint of beer I'm drinking and not a cup of tea out of a cat mug? Would that be possible? Just think real hard about it. You can make anything real in your mind. Nor Unisa Enayat Khan was born on January 1st, 1914 in Moscow. Her father was Enayat Khan, descended from Indian royalty. So she's sometimes referred to as the princess spy, but that's kind of... Nonsense? Yes, but her dad was descended from Indian royalty. Aren't we all? Aren't we all somewhere? Especially if you're British, right? You know, like, surely you've got some royalty somewhere in there. The way it works in the UK, Paula, is the more inbred that you look, the more likely it is that you could be royalty. There's literally something called, what was it called? It's the something jaw. Like, is it called the Habsburg jaw? That and it's sounds this, familiar, yes. Looks like you're going to be king if you can make it past childhood. So Inayat Khan was also a Sufi mystic. Her mother was an American named Aura Ray Baker, which is the most flappery name I have ever heard, even if she was definitely not a flapper. This is pre-flapper times for sure. That's Carly Rae Jepsen level of flapper name. <laughs> But after leaving the U.S. to marry in a yacht, Aura Ray changed her name to Purani Amina Begum. Just before World War I, the family left Russia and moved to London, and then... Smart. Smart. They were like, we gotta get out of here. And then they moved again to Paris, France, when Nora was six. She and her siblings grew up in the constant presence of her father's students, and his teachings influenced them all deeply. So Sufism, which I learned about for this episode, Sufism is a form of Islam uh, and believes in a unity of being, a connection to the divine, the oneness of all, and a shunning of materialism. It's like a mystic... Yes. Esque type part of the Islamic faith, yeah. Yes. So because of this belief in these teachings, Inayat himself was a pacifist and instilled this philosophy in his children. Ah, a coward. I see. That's interesting. <laughs> a coward. I know you don't believe that. <laughs> I don't. Inayat was also a musician and passed this on to his children as well. Noor learned to play multiple instruments and was a very talented harpist. When Noor was 13, her father died while traveling and her mother fell into a deep depression as a result. Nor took on many of the responsibilities of taking care of her three younger siblings in an effort to support her mother through this time. Nor was super smart. She went on to study child psychology at the leading mm -hmm. university in Paris, as well as continuing to study music at the Paris Conservatory. She then began a career as a writer with her poetry and children's stories being published in magazines and on French radio. Wait, that's no, that's too many. That's that's too too many things to have achieved. I'm sorry. That's that's. By the time no. she's like, I don't know. At this point, she's what? Uh, mid twenties. 20, yeah, mid twenties. Yeah. Who's she trying to impress? In 1939, I'm just going to add to her list of things. Uh, she has a book published in France, the UK, and it also is in the US. Twenty Jataka Tales, which is a retelling of traditional Buddhist stories for children. Yeah. Well, I. <laughs> I've got a podcast. I was going to say, what have we done? Uh, we're making this video right now? Be impressed. Please, be impressed. I need so to impress a woman somewhere in the world. That's all I need. Just one. We find ourselves now back in the summer of 1940, where our episode started. Germany has invaded France, and Noor and her family flee the country along with many other refugees. They end up in Cornwall, England in June 1940. <laughs> where do they end up? <laughs> Cornwall? Cornwall. How are you? How am I supposed to? You say sound it? like you're. The funny thing is, is you sound like you're from Cornwall when you say it. Is that how they sound, Southern? Of course they do. They sound a bit West Country. It's not quite the West, but you, yeah. How Cornwall. Cornwall. Like wool. Like wool. Like, like wool. Cornwall. Yeah, Cornwall. 
Cornwall. Fun fact. Cornwall? Apparently. No, the way you. No, uh, go back to the way you're doing it before. It's fine. <laughs> Cornwall. 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 Corn. I forgot how I say it now, if I'm honest. They're all rich yuppies there anyway. Well, you'll like this. Uh, apparently, it comes from two words that put together mean horn foreigner. That makes sense. So it's go. a horn part of the southern tip of the country, and it was its own country at one point as well. So I guess they are foreigners, yeah. They got their own language, Paula. Cornish. I get it. You you make pasties and you make scones. Guess what? Firstly, so does everyone else. <laughs> and secondly, no one cares, Cornwall, all right? Well, luckily, Nor didn't stay there long. I'm from the West Midlands. It's hard here. It's real here. It's Mordor there. Oh, they did do a lot of uh, copper mining in Cornwall, and there's a parts of, I think it's Brazil, mm -hmm. where they needed people to go over. So there's like places in Brazil where a bunch of Cornish people all hung out. Yeah. Wow. Like like Welsh, like there's a bunch of there's places in Brazil. It might be, it's somewhere in Central America, actually, I think. And there's a whole town, and it's basically like Wales, because a bunch of Welsh miners had to go over there and mine some coal. Little Wales. Little, little Wales. Back to World War II spies. So Nor has too much of her father's teachings and beliefs in her to be happy sitting by as the Nazis occupy her home, right? She and her brother Vilayat are desperate to help in some way that also suits their pacifist philosophy. They felt they should take on something dangerous that would ultimately serve to protect others and not require them to kill anyone, which is an important part of being a pacifist. Let me think, what could they do? They could... Nope, everything I've got an idea for would involve killing Nazis. Well, Vilyat joined the Royal Navy and became a minesweeper and spent the rest of his days sat in front of his Windows 95 machine and you would not believe his high score. <laughs> I got really addicted to minesweeper recently. You know, heard about, yeah, you know about I, this. I you? thought of you when I wrote this joke. Nor joined the Women's Auxiliary Air Force and trained there as a wireless operator. So it isn't long before she's recruited to the SOE. She's apparently bored with her work in the WAA, and she has two specific qualities that make her very appealing to the SOE. One, she is very good on the radio, perhaps due to her dexterous harp string plucking fingers. Oh yeah, she's really good at the harp. Is the other one that she speaks French? Yes. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Basically, <laughs> if you could speak the language of a territory where agents were needed behind enemy lines, you're a shoo-in for the SOE. They're like, oh, you fluent in French? You're in. We need you. Thank you. You may go. So she was fluent in French and English then? Yes. At least. Yes. Mm -hmm. I have to assume she knew some German as well and it's possibly possible. some Russian. I don't know for sure, but it's very possible. But Nora didn't have the easiest time in training. Not all of her training officers thought she was fit to go behind enemy lines. Her report said that she was imaginative, sensitive, emotional, too idealistic, Unwilling to lie, that might be a deal breaker for being a spy. Can you imagine the next James <laughs> Bond film? The spy who told the truth. Are you part of the resistance? Oh. Yes. <laughs> Shit. Uh, she was unathletic, scared of weapons, and in my favorite quote from her training reports, not overburdened with brains. That's not true, though. It's not. She was really smart. I think exactly what you said. I think they just didn't understand her mm. for multiple reasons. I think because... She was a pacifist, and I think that was yeah. really different. Just and highly also, bizarre. This is unusual at this time to be training women in this particular kind of work. So I think a lot of the training officers were not used to working with the personality and emotional differences women may have than men. Also, as well, it's like she's going to go behind enemy lines and she doesn't want to use a gun. She must be an idiot because she lacks common sense. But it's her philosophical beliefs yeah. that are holding it to that standard. So. In a response to this quote about not being overburdened with brains uh, that I have multiple mixed feelings about, Maurice Buckmaster, great last name, great. who was the head of F section, wrote in the margins of her report, we don't want them overburdened with brains. Yeah, it, we want them to do what they're told, not think for themselves. <laughs> that makes sense. Also, I want to be fair to the training officer who made the brain statement, and I want to be fair to Noor and paint a broader picture of her. So I'm going to actually read you the full quote from the report to put it in context. Quote, not overburdened with brains, but has worked hard and sh actually I'll do this how, how he would have said it, right? <clears throat> I knew quote, I knew you couldn't resist doing an accent here, but go on. Not overburdened with brains, but has worked hard and shown keenness. Apart from some dislike of the security side of the course, 
She has an unstable and temperamental personality, and it is very doubtful whether she is really suited to work in the field. When did he go back to his tenure at Hogwarts? <laughs> Can't help but sound like Hermione. <laughs> but y'all, Buckmaster needs wireless operators in France. And Vera Atkins, the intelligence officer for F Section, spends time with Noor and is convinced that she's qualified and ready. And so they assign her an incredibly dangerous mission <laughs> be the first female wireless operator behind enemy lines in France. Cheers, Bucky. Thanks for that. Yeah. Bucky is an interesting, he makes some interesting choices throughout this story. And I think this speaks a little bit to like the desperation that they were feeling and trying to fight back. At this point, like it's just Britain left. Yeah, I think a lot of people forget. Because everything else has been taken over or is neutral, you know, and like they're they're desperate to try and stop this. And they're convinced, I mean, that Germany is trying to invade Britain next, you know. Well, I think... There's a difference. It's a complicated situation, but a lot of British people will say we were fighting the war single-handedly at this point. And while in a sense that is true on paper, what war they were fighting is kind of unclear. Everyone thinks World War Two was one war. It wasn't. It was multiple wars going on at the same time to a mm. grand extent. You know, there were people fighting in the Pacific. The Chinese yes. and the Japanese were fighting in 1937, you know. So it wasn't just the British because they weren't even in the, like, the East at all. But as far as the war in Europe contextually was, it felt to Britain, I think, at that time that they really were fighting on their own. Yeah. I mean, there was obviously a lot of Irish who came over, like belayed orders to not do so and they only just got recognized for doing that very recently a few years ago that it was against the rules some of my research for this um and this is a little different because it's not ireland and there's a whole relationship thing happening there but like canadian officers or canadian people came over to join the soe and in you know go behind enemy lines in france and help people from yeah absolutely multiple countries but it was through Britain's SOE, who is really trying to get in behind these enemy lines and make it harder for the Nazis to continue to hold control of these countries. I think when people say Britain was fighting alone, they mean the Commonwealth was fighting on its own, which obviously encompasses a much, many, many countries at that time. And it was in the sphere itself of the Western Front, as well as it doesn't really give much credence to the people who were fighting for their lives in France, you know, and in countries like that, in Belgium and stuff, where there was resistance and there was still fighting and stuff. So I think it's one of those things where some British people will say, oh, we, you know, fighting the war on our own until America decided to turn up when it was in their best interest to do so. And then other people get annoyed at that, which I totally understand, because that's not really true either. Everyone wants to be the the best boxer in the ring, I guess it is. It's also a very high stakes situation, which means emotions run high in that moment and in talking about it and remembering it, I think. Also, there is a level of it where you have to accept. I mean, Britain obviously had one of the best navies at the time, the best navy in the world at the time. It was certainly probably one of the better prepared countries because it hadn't suffered the same physical toil of World War One, mm. as in infrastructure wise. Right. But... We are an island, yeah. and I think for that reason, got kind of lucky. It's harder <laughs> you know? to get to, yeah. Yeah. So at this time, women are already being used as couriers, and this was seen as a great strategy. <sighs> because I thought you were going to say for currency, and I'm so glad you didn't. <laughs> and that's <laughs> another. So most people don't suspect that women would be doing this sort of dangerous work, so they could get away with a lot more. So not being able to tell her family where she's going or what she's doing and knowing that most wireless operators only last six weeks before they're caught, Nor accepts her assignment and is flown into a field in France under the cover of darkness. From there, she makes her way into Paris where she joins her circuit known as Prosper. That's pretty cool, honestly. I'm not going to lie. That's cool. Yeah, she's flown in with a couple other people. They're met by someone and then they kind of like make their way through to establish themselves with their aliases. And hers was Jean-Marie Regnier. Mm -hmm. And that was meant to be a nurse. 
Unfortunately, within a week of her arrival, within a week of her arrival, the Gestapo began rounding up members of the Prosper Circuit. The Gestapo? The g- it served ice cold, Paula, like their justice. <laughs> You're going to make me paranoid about it. Now I'm going to say just, I'm not even going to be able to say the word now. Gestapo? <laughs> I'm going to just say the, the Nazi police. It's hard to know exactly what caused the circuit, one of the biggest and most important in France, to fall apart. It might have been betrayal and double-crossing by someone on the inside. It might have been a previously arrested agent succumbing to torture and interrogation and giving up information that led to their capture. Whatever it was, it is soon clear that Nor is the only wireless operator left. Buckmaster, the head of F section, offers to bring Nor home. Everyone else is getting caught. Her staying in France is very risky, but Noor knows that without her radio, Prosper isn't the only F-section circuit that will fall apart. Without a wireless operator, no resistance strategy can be coordinated. There would be no one telling London what was needed behind enemy lines or telling the field agents what London wanted them to do or where supplies would be dropped. Without the wireless operator, the plans just die. She becomes one of the most important military figures in the war. Yeah. Nor insists on staying in France because she knows that without her, everything is lost. I just got, sorry, I just gave myself goosebumps. The logistics of being a wireless operator were not easy. You have to carry your radio around with you everywhere. And it's not the most subtle thing in the world. You look like you're carrying a suitcase everywhere. And they're not light. Some models weighed around nine pounds, but some weighed up to 30 pounds. I could not lug that around inconspicuously. 30 pounds. I know. I've, like, I've, been, I've been with you while you've traveled Porter, and it's honestly... Shut it's... up. <laughs> then, to actually transmit or receive messages, you have to find a place to set up, hook up the power supply, string out 60 <laughs> feet of aerial wire as your antenna. <laughs> yeah. How on earth did she manage to do this once? Even if you can hide yourself physically while operating, you're sending audible signals. The Nazis could hear your messages just like London could, which is why they had to be coded. And any messages you get back had to be properly decoded. And you couldn't forget to include your bluff check, a keyword assigned to each operator that was proof that they were actually the person sending the messages. Oh, and don't stay on the radio for more than 20 minutes because the Nazis have trucks that can determine the location of the radio signals. And if you're transmitting for longer than 20 minutes, they're probably going to find you. They triangulate on you, yeah. Yeah. And this is what Nor is doing all alone, constantly on the move for 16 weeks. 16 weeks. Wow. But finally, 10 weeks past the life expectancy of a wireless operator, Nor is arrested. Some people blame Henry Henri, Derricor, an accused double agent who supposedly let the Gestapo read all the mail the SOE agents were sending back to their homes. He is often cited as the person who betrayed Prosper Circuit to the Nazis. Now that being said, he was tried and acquitted for being a double agent. And you're going to love this, Matthew. There are some theories that he was a triple agent and that his betrayal of the Prosper Circuit agents was actually an order from MI6 who he was also working for. I find that difficult to believe, considering so many important assets were murdered because of it. But maybe, I guess, maybe. The idea is MI6 wanted this to fail to to throw the Nazis off to think that D-Day was actually happening sooner than it did. I have no idea. Who knows? There's going to be many podcasts about the ridiculous schemes of intelligence agencies during World War II floating dead bodies into harbors to make people believe that certain people were dead or coming up with doubles and that type of thing. There's lots of fun stories about all that, but I guess nothing is off the table during World War, right? Yeah. Okay, the other theory is Renee Gary, the sister of Noor's organizer in the field. People say she was jealous of Noor for a variety of reasons. Beauty, lost love. Someone was like, Renee wanted to be an SOE agent and she was turned down. So she was jealous of Noor. I don't know. For whatever reason, she was allegedly paid 100,000 francs by the Nazis to tell them where they could find Noor. But Noor didn't go easily. 
She apparently fought back during the arrest to such an extreme that the Gestapo tasked with bringing her in threatened to just shoot her right there and then if she didn't cut it out. What she's not supposed to do, he's supposed to bring her back for interrogation. And she's such a pain in his butt. He's like, I'll just shoot you, which I love. (laughs) While in captivity in France, Noor refuses to cooperate. She won't tell the Nazis anything or give up any information despite their torture and interrogation. Unfortunately, the Gestapo found her radio and her code book, and they use it to continue sending messages back to the SOE pretending to be Nor. For some reason, old Bucky ignores the fact that they aren't using their bluff check, and it takes a lot longer than it probably should have for the SOE to realize that Nor is compromised. Why have these checks and balances in place if when things start going awry, they don't immediately act on them? I don't know why he... I don't know why he... Had she had a history of forgetting to put in her codes and stuff? I don't think so. Yeah, I have no idea. It's wishful thinking, you know? I think probably so. During all of this, Nor is trying to escape. She and two other SOE prisoners work together to escape through a bathroom window and up to the roof. And I think they could have been home free, except an air raid goes off and it's policy to check on prisoners during an air raid. So due to the worst coincidence of all time, yeah, they're discovered. They're just in tenement housing in Paris, aren't yeah. they, at this point? Basically, it's not yeah. like It's yeah. not like they're in... A big prison. No, they're not in a prison. They're being held in a house and basically locked in their room. So there's a bathroom they have access to. They could obviously get up on the roof. Yeah, they're just in like a building in France. Nora doesn't give up. And after her second escape attempt, the Nazis decide she is too dangerous to be kept around any longer. They're not going to get any information out of her anyway. So she's sent away. And look, honestly, I don't want to go into lots of details about her solitary confinement, her months of being chained in a dark room all alone, Sorry, gosh, of how she would tap out Morse code to her neighbors so someone would know who she was. Because this is supposed to be a fun World War II spy story. And it's not because of the fucking Nazis. And I hate them. It's got a sad ending to the story, but she probably saved a lot of people's lives, you know? Yeah, I think so. So she ends up in Dachau, a concentration camp. Yeah. It's not a nice place. Uh, she ends up executed with some other female spies. Shot. They they shot them uh, in the back of the neck. There are reports that her last words before being executed were liberty. I don't know if that's true. But I like it. I think yeah. it's nice and brave. And that's how I want to remember Nor in a yacht con. Nor was posthumously awarded a Croix de Guerre with a silver star by France for her service during the war. She was also awarded the George Cross in 1949, Britain's highest honor for people not directly involved in battle. It is for acts of the greatest heroism or for most conspicuous courage in circumstance of extreme danger. Only two other women were awarded the George Cross. I just think the... The war could have been so much better if, I guess, more women pulled their weight, I guess. Why didn't they do their part, you know? (laughs) Too busy painting pantyhose lines up the back of their legs, you know what I'm saying? (laughs) Too busy running the country. (laughs) Too busy, you know, working in the factories and playing baseball in America. (laughs) They weren't Um, playing that. They weren't playing that much baseball. That's (laughs) one time they played baseball. Stay tuned for a future episode. I want to talk about the real league of their own but oh my god it's one of the best movies ever so love that it'll film be such a great story madonna's in that film and rosie o'donnell yeah but madonna's but in madonna. it so she's great <laughs> in 2012 a bronze bust of nor was put up in gordon square gardens in london and in 2020 she got a blue plaque which made me really excited it's at 4 Taverton Street in Bloomsbury, London. That's like Spy District 101, I think. <laughs> Bloomsbury, yeah. <laughs> the next time I'm in London, I'm going to be looking it up. Yeah, that'd be good to do. We've done a lot of blue plaque hunting in London before, and uh, that'd be nice to go and see. That's the story of Nora in Yacht Khan. What an amazing person, I would say. For someone who's a pacifist, she was certainly braver than I am. Incredibly brave and self-sacrificing. 
and worth more people knowing yeah her. i think so too which is, is there really a movie why about i it? wanted to do this there is a movie that came out in 2019 maybe it's about a couple different i think it's about three different female spies in world war ii and she's one of them okay and i'm gonna put an image of that right here in our video on youtube so that you can see what it's called Thank you so much for watching this episode of Remember Remember. You know what? If you don't want to see my face for some reason, <laughs> what's wrong with you? It's you fine. Like looking at us? Look, it's not the best face. I can admit that, but it's not that bad. But you can just listen to our sultry to oh, I'm not selling this. You can listen to this as a <laughs> podcast. You can picture any face and this voice. You can listen to a podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. The best way to help this show out is, of course, by telling someone about the show who you think might enjoy it. Share it around, that type of thing. But thank you so much for being here. Thanks for watching. Paula, thank you so much for doing your research and telling us all about this yeah. story. And until next time, everybody, thank you and bye. Bye, everyone. <laughs>